Welcome to the Insight Through Experience podcast, a podcast created to provide information about what life is like inside the most specialized special tactics organization in the U.S. Air Force. In these episodes, we'll be bringing you the experiences from many of our experts, ranging from our human performance optimization staff, our combat mission supporters, as well as our special warfare operators. Our main objective with these podcasts are to provide the listener with a unique look inside our culture of excellence. Now sit back, relax, take some notes, prepare to hear from some of the Air Force's finest. Thank you for joining us on the Insight Through Experience podcast. All right, it's good to be back, everybody. It's been a while, I know. Uh, we've just been redefining some things, getting our feet back under us, lots of changes, lots of business going down up here in our world. Uh, so it's good to be back. So we just got done with another Operator Selection. Operator Selection 2404 is now in the books. We're getting ready for Operator Selection 2405, which is going to kick off here in a few weeks. Uh, but today, I'm bringing four of the candidates who were selected to come to the organization at the end of um, 2404. Uh, Charlie 11 one is a STO. Charlie 12 two is a TAC P. Charlie 44 four is a PJ, and Charlie 48 is a combat controller. So bringing you the full gamut of career fields, and we hope that you're going to enjoy what they're laying down here. So basically, the format is: I just send them some questions the night before. They only have a few hours to look over them and formulate at least some answers that are hopefully comprehensible to you out there. And what they're trying to do is just provide value back out to the community to give you some lessons that they learned the hard way and try to ensure you are prepared to be your best self when you come up here for operator selection. So let's get into it. Appreciate all of you joining Insight Through Experience podcast. All right, guys, welcome to the show. I know it's early just for the audience. I'm getting these guys up. It's basically about 10 till 6 in the morning. Uh, they agreed to come on here and do this. So first off, guys, congratulations for getting selected. Uh, that's not an easy thing to do. So I appreciate you guys tuning in. I appreciate you being here. Uh, thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone. Charlie, one one. Uh, excited to be here on the podcast. Obviously, just had a very long week. Extremely challenging. Hopefully, today can answer any questions some of y'all might have and offer my experience and my lens of what we just went through. And I look forward to diving into some of these questions. Yeah, Charlie, one too. Excited to be here. And I know it's early. Just got through uh, probably one of the most difficult things I've done in my life, and I'm happy to be here to answer some questions today. Charlie44, uh, excited to be here on the podcast. Uh, like we said, a little early, so we'll see if we can get this going, and we'll see what we got after the craziest week of my life. Yep, Charlie48, uh, same goes for me. Just excited to possibly help out some dudes that want to come through here and uh, put it on the line. All right, let's start with the one one. What I want to dig in with the first question for this is um, why were you here in the first place? So what was the motivating factor behind you applying for selection right now at this point in your career? Yes, sir. Obviously, uh, my wife and my family are some of the most important things to me. So always joining the military, wanting to you know, provide security to them and continue my family's legacy of service. That's the baseline. But I've been grateful for every opportunity the 720th has provided me. However, there's just no place for the opportunities to um, capitalize on the skills you've trained and to work around hand-selected operators and support that are just of the highest caliber in the DOD. So now is the best timing for me, and there's always busy work that you have to kind of work around. However, sometimes you just have to send in. This was the perfect time, so I wanted to get this, come up here and see what I could do. Awesome. Thanks. One, 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 two. Uh, I had a, a pretty unique process entering this. I had the opportunity to be in the organization uh, in a fire shop capacity. So I had uh, I was able to see see professional operators on a daily basis. And I think that's what really drove my motivation, seeing how those guys operate, how they took every every task and they, they went 100 percent. And it really drove me to want to uh, want to be in that same caliber. Uh, and I, I felt I felt tested by by my environment. And eventually got to the point where this is what I wanted to do. And I decided to put in a package and, and show up here and see if I see if I had what it took and just kind of throw my name in the hat. Charlie, one, two. Uh, just before we lose this moment, you said you were in the fire shop. So for the tech peas out there, why might the fire shop be a good way to come into the organization and figure out um, if it's somewhere that you want to be before you come to selection? I think uh, the fire shop was. Like I said, it was a unique experience. I didn't really understand what I was getting into. 
I just kind of came across some email traffic uh, about about the organization, about how you could uh, you could do more than what you're doing currently. So I did that. I got exposure to to the organization firsthand. I got to see the mission set, and uh, I think it really drove the motivation to to go further with an organization. Because as a TAC P, we don't really understand fully the organization until you get up here and you kind of see it. It's uh, it was definitely eye opening. And uh, I really, really enjoyed that that insight uh, before kind of stepping into the deep end of the pool. Awesome. Thanks for that. 4-4 four, four of you, what was the motivating factor for you to apply right now? I've uh, been in the operational uh, career field here for about a, two and a half years, and I haven't really gotten to do much of any of my actual AFSE for PJ, uh, just kind of traveling around the world doing JSETs. And while that's fun, you know, that's not really why I joined. Join to do medicine, join to do technical rescue, you know, all the things that go with being a PJ. Um, and once the GWAT ended, it kind of became clear that the only place to actually get those experiences was here at the unit and at the organization. So uh, I just realized that now is the time to put in my package and come up here and give it my shot. Awesome. Well said. 4-8, over to you. Yep. So obviously, like my family being my wine. Uh, my nephews at home, I wanted to be an example for them. And if there was a higher level to play at, like I wanted to go to that level. And uh, so that's why I decided to put in my packet and come up here um, just to be surrounded every day by people who wanted to get after it and solve the nation's highest problems. Yeah, I love it. Love those answers. Appreciate those. Um, it's always good for a guy who's running the process to hear um, why you guys are even going through and having somebody like me um, stress you all week. So let's start with one, two on this one. So I just want you to riff. I just want you to take a moment. Um, there's no guidelines here. Just talk about your experience during the last week and what stands out the most as you look back at the process. Early one, two. I think what stands out the most, um, not because it was re most recent, but uh, definitely the exfil. Uh, going through that process and seeing seeing the teamwork firsthand was was, uh, was definitely cool to see. On both ends of, ends of the spectrum, uh, when one teammate went down, everyone felt it, and you can kind of you can kind of see that happen when we were moving, and we had that. I know we talked about it internally afterwards, but that harmonic movement, and we were getting the job done, and then one one guy went down, everything the chain broke and exploded, and we had to uh, come back together. Everyone's stressed out, tired, haven't slept, been putting in miles and miles and hours and hours, and just getting back together and and get into that teamwork to get the, the task at hand complete. I think what, what stuck out the most to me is a lot of the process is individually based. And uh, that, that particular moment, we can kind of see how the teamwork really played into it. Awesome. 4-4? Four, 4-4 four. Uh, four, four here. Uh, I think probably the thing that sticks out in my mind the most was really just how fast everything went by. You know, I think if you write it down on a sheet of paper and you actually look like you're going to go do – X event, X event, X event, all the way down, you're going to look at that piece of paper and you're going to say, there's no way we're going to be able to do that in a week. And, you know, you and your whole team did. And going through this kind of suck fest with your team also, like, you build some great relationships with guys. And those are things that, you know, you're going to take away that while it was only a week, like, I feel like some of these guys are going to be some of my better friends, you know, going forward in life here. So. Uh, just kind of looking at that has been my biggest takeaway here from the ANS process. Just from experience over the last 25 years being a part of the organization, it is amazing how when you get into a room, even if you don't see these guys for a while, and then somehow a couple of you end up in the same room, um, the relationship you have with them is different. It's different. You might be in a room with close friends back at your other unit or somewhere else, but when you're in the the room with these guys that you went through this week with, it's just different. Um, you you have a bond that nobody understands. Uh, it's pretty cool. 4-8, over to you. So 4-8 here. Um, I would just say the personal and the professional reflection that you have, that you have throughout this process, um, you really have to be vulnerable from, like, the get-go from day one because it does go by so fast, like 4-4 four, four said. Um, it doesn't feel like it, but it does. Um, you have to take – it's just take all that feedback, good or bad, from your peers, and you have to attempt to apply it in the next event because 
if you think you, you're, you're going to have time down the road to apply it, like it's over and that you may uh, be putting bad data into the system and they're not, you're not going to give the, the commander enough uh, product to make a decision off of. One, one here. Uh, the first thing that immediately stuck out to my, uh, in my mind, looking, reflecting on the week was the guys I was surrounded with. I mean, 30, 31 individuals who were super motivated. Uh, I know you're not trying to compare yourself to somebody, but just that informal competition of every time you're doing an event, looking at the guy next to you and going, I want to beat that guy. And he's saying, I want to beat you too. Just such a cool place to be where everyone has the same mindset and is pushing towards the same goal is really refreshing and brings the best out of everybody. The second one, looking a little bit deeper, that really stood out to me when I sat back and reviewed the week was the expectations. The uh, What I mean by that is the caliber of the cadre expectations and the organization, the people that are putting you through this process really hammers home to you, like why this is such a unique unit to work for or to want to work for. They don't accept mediocrity. They, you know, there are some things designed to stress you, but you can tell that that's because they expect the best out of you and you need to show that. Yeah, good. One thing that just uh, resonated with me, honestly, that you said the first thing up front, I think that's why I'm still at this organization because where else are you going to go? Like when you've been here so long, um, any organization that you go work for in the civilian world or wherever else, you don't walk into the gym and everybody's expecting to beat you. They, everybody wants to beat you. You want to beat everybody. You go to the team room, you go into the range. It's the same. You are surrounded by the most motivated, driven dudes in the world. So how do you leave that? I haven't figured it out yet. I've got too soon, but man, I don't know how you do it. All right, let's go over to four, four for this one. I'm going to love this question. And it doesn't, it doesn't, y'all don't have to shape your answers anyway. Um, but try to describe the atmosphere of selection. Cause I think we all have our perceived ideas of what's going to happen when we get there. And then for most people, I think, I don't want to say it's shattered, but it's altered greatly as you start moving through the process. So, uh, come up with a good comparison or analogy just to help the future candidates understand, um, what that environment is going to be like. So we kind of can shape their perceptions a little bit and get down some of that fear that people have about coming here. 4-4 four, four here. When I'm looking back here at this, I think the analogy that kind of sticks out in my mind the most is organized chaos. Just you think when you come in, you know, you've talked to some guys who may have come to selection, whether they got picked up or not. And, you know, they give you some things to work on. You know, you do your research, you listen to all the materials that are out there by you know, that are put out there by the organization and you come in with kind of an idea of what is going to happen. And you kind of start playing that out in your mind, you know, saying, okay, we're going to do this. So, and then I'm going to move to that. And it kind of quickly goes, you know, haywire and you don't really have that ability to, you know, plan ahead anymore, so to say, and you're kind of just going off the cuff and, you know, that's that chaos that I think the ANS process brings in and forces you to adapt and overcome you know, really contain your your nerves and your anxiety and channel that into some sort of a positive end result. So that's kind of, that's what sticks out to me most about, you know, this week. Good. Let's go over to 4-8. So again, try to describe the atmosphere. What was it coming in from your perspective? And then how did that change? What's a good analogy or something we can prep the candidate, future candidates with? Yep. So I kind of broke, I broke this down into two phases when answering this um, question, I would say, so the first phase, um, I would go online and research the country's best reviewed three to five day personal professional development course. Um, that's what you're going to get in the first phase of this assessment. Um, you're going to take a lot of tests. You're going to do a lot of team stuff in a garrison environment um, with a little, you know, some physical, but not a lot thrown in there. And then the second phase would be if you took that same type of course and you just added military substance to it. Um, you're going to do some MDMP, some problem solving, obviously physical events, um, a lot of rucking and stuff like that. But um, that's, that's how I would break it down, uh, just as simple as I could in those two phases. Thanks. Uh, one, one over to you. Mr. Free, you're going to be a little disappointed. I'm going to stay in my street light here, but sometimes going with what you know is good to try and describe this to maybe people that are listening. 
talking about football here in a second. I'm about to say that. Yes, sir. You've got it. Uh, I would describe selection as uh, being a playing on a contending college football team. Unlike the NFL, a lot of guys have sit, made the the link that in an NFL you can lose games. It's not a big deal. But if you're a contending college football team, every single game matters for the national championship. You can't relax. Uh, you take a loss, <clears throat> you might be out of the running. And I'd say selection is a lot like that. You have to have that same mindset and treat every single game like it was. it's the most important game there is. And um, if you do have a misstep, the other thing about that is relying on your teammates. Can't tell you how many times you just look at a dude that's funny or doing something and you just crack a joke and you're right back in it. That's what I would say, sir. Cool. One, two, over to you. Charlie one two here. Uh, unfortunately, Charlie Charlie one one uh, stole some thunder there. I was uh, I was going to resort back to. Unfortunately, I didn't play college football, but I did uh, I did play high school football, and I think that's what the atmosphere kind of reminded me of. It was kind of more or less like a spring training camp where a lot of the players might not know each other. You're kind of getting there. You're obviously going to evaluate yourself. You're going to look at yourself. You're going to look at others and kind of compare yourself. And you don't really know know what to expect until you guys get out there and start working. Um, and I think it, it starts slow, like obviously in that environment, just like we did in this process, things were slow. You're kind of ready to take that first hit. And once you take that first hit and then you're just at that point, you're, you're in it and you're just rolling with the punches. Uh, and that's kind of what it felt like for the rest of the week. I was just ready to take that first hit. And when I did, I was, I was comfortable or I felt more comfortable in an uncomfortable environment. And then I was able to just keep pushing forward. And I was actually having fun at some points. <laughs> For you, I think the first hit is different for everybody. Um, one, two. What what was the first hit for you that started shaking up the snow globe? I think going into uh, definitely going into the combine. I think so when, that's when the nerves are the highest. Like I said, you're kind of comparing yourself. You're like, I don't know what this guy has, and maybe he's a sleeper. He's going to come out, and there definitely were some sleepers that came out and just crushed it. And then there was uh, there were some points where I felt really good, and there were some points where I felt really bad. I know. One one was actually in my group, so we were competing against each other, and we were getting done with the events, and we weren't supposed to talk, but obviously we were over in the corner, like, man, you, you crushed that, or the same, vice versa, and that was really pushing us to go further than I had in training and, and putting up some numbers and some of the things that I, I wasn't uh, I was surprised by, and, and some I was seeing some numbers I was very surprised by as well, especially on that Echo bike. Some guys were, were crushing that. Um, four four. You said organized chaos. When did that start? When was the trigger for that? I'd say I'd have to go um, one of our first like uh, mission planning processes in the hotel in the garrison phase. Um, you know, we all kind of did our little bit of planning. We thought we had a great product from uh, what we as a team had created, and then you know we come in to present, and before anybody ever said a word, it very quickly determined that, no, you kind of missed the mark. And so, you know, you go in with that plan, like, oh, yeah, we got this figured out. And then, again, before we ever present, it was made known to us that this is going to be a very painful presentation. So I hope you all are ready in the end. Um, and, you know, that was that chaos that was thrown in there right there. You know, okay, right before we start our presentation, we're told we just bombed it. So what are we going to do? Um, so that was that kind of using that anxiety as some sort of positive and trying to channel it forward and, you know, stay true and just keep going. Man, I love those thoughts. I was hoping that was the event you were going to say because that's exactly where we see it on our end. That's where the true chaos of the moment starts. Don't get me wrong. One, two's nailing it, too, because um, during the combine and it, especially for people who didn't prep well for the combine or at least uh, I think their chaos starts early. Right. But if you prepared. Um, the combine's just going to be a physical challenge, and then you're going to get to the other side. Once we get into the first problem-solving event is where you start realizing how things are going to be there and how, man, we can't just get by with some shallow planning where if you scratch the paint on it, it's going to be evident that we didn't do too much thinking on it. So, yeah, love it. One-one, would you – either one of those stand out to you? Absolutely, sir, <clears throat> uh, especially for my role as a, as a STO, that first mission planning exercise. Um, that's our bread and butter. And we do our best and we're kind of going down the road, seeing the plan come together. And we're like, OK, this is hitting the mark. And then you get your butcher block paper up there and you're kind of standing back. You finally see it all come together and you go. Oh, dang. Uh, well, 
let's go with it. And um, really, I'd say just being ready to defend and be confident in what you have. Like, you know, you know, you're going to be outmatched, but uh, still, still, you know, defending the team and defending your plan the best you can, but realizing where you fell short as well is really important. Yeah, all well said. And I think people have to remember not everything that was up there was bad, right? You got to at least take onus in the fact that some of the stuff that we did, at least how we came together was good, but um, man, we got to figure out really quick how to eliminate the bad because it isn't going to be the last time. Or how did you see it coming in? Where was the chaos? Where did it start in your world as you were starting to begin selection? Yeah, I would, I would have to agree the, the planning, like when you get that many guys together that have never worked together uh, from different AFSCs and, uh, you pull them into a room and you give them a, a task and like a mission like that. And dudes are button heads, you know, obviously working good together, but there's a lot of different ideas coming together and you have to organize those ideas and uh, throw them up on butcher block and, and then get absolutely annihilated from the cadre for it. It's something where you, you have to like step back and you have to take the good from it, like you said, and, um, just learn and move on. I think that's the biggest takeaway from the entire week is you kind of have to, I think the analogy we kept using was you got to live like a goldfish. Um, you got to see something, you got to experience it. You got to get shut down for it and you got to move on, take what you can, take the, take the, take the bits that you can and move on from it and learn. All right. So one, one, we're going to come back to you for this one. So, um, just for the audience at the end of it, I send the guys a Google form feedback um, really where they can describe, I'm asking them some questions. They can describe their selection experience one, so they can kind of relive it. And I'm trying to help them solidify some of the things in their head because it's really fresh, still, still probably formulating in their memory. And two, it's for me. So I can also figure out, are we having the, the experience or are we giving them the experience that we're intended to as, as we created the process? So one of the questions I asked um, was about mental difficulty and really I'm asking them on a scale of one to 10, rate the mental difficulty that you faced this week. So Charlie one, one gave it a 10, Charlie one, two gave it a 10, Charlie four, four gave it a 10, Charlie four, eight gave it a eight. So over to you one, one, just explain your rating and how you thought about that mental challenge as the week progressed. Yes, sir. One, one here. <clears throat> Reason I gave this a 10 <clears throat> is because the, what I call it is the standard of excellence at this selection event is an all time high. Uh, you know, there is an element of us versus them. You are essentially competing against the cadre to show what you have. But then you realize that you're going up against some of the best operators in the DOD who have briefed at the highest levels of leadership. And that requires all of your brain power. You can't slip up and you can't zone out because you're going to miss something and you're going to get destroyed for it. And then when you go into that kind of process, understanding that you're not going to crush everything, you're going to have times that you don't do your best. And if this process, if this organization, the organization you're currently in means a lot to you, then that's going to weigh on you. And you have to figure out a way to pull out of it and move forward as soon as possible. And that's why I gave it a 10, because that was every single day, every single event, every interaction, that brain is firing and you have to be on your A game. Thinking officers specifically, how would you just advise somebody um, to prep for that, that what you faced mentally? Yeah, absolutely. I would say definitely hammering down like everyone knows everyone can rattle off the TLPs, the MDMP, uh, different formats of military, but rehearsing those and standardizing those and applying those to maybe non-standard military problem sets, you know, in your daily life too, you could do something as simple as when you go to the grocery store, just taking out your notebook and what doesn't apply in mission analysis, what does, and just use that as a format that's going to help you. Cause when you're tired and there's chaos, having some type of organizational format is really going to help. And lastly, what I said for that mental side of it is, you know, I've always had kind of just internal discussions with myself, been able to pull myself out, but wasted a little bit of time. I would say standardize, develop, and like rehearse a process that you have found that can help you quickly recenter and drive on, whether that's just a little mantra or some type of thing you do physically, just stretch out a second and, and reflect, but some type of quick process that you can repeat that's going to help you just flush it, take what you can from something and move on. Yeah, good stuff. When it comes to TLPs or MDMP, I think what you said is spot on. Uh, we expect you to be really good at it. 
we're not going to give you time to do the whole cycle. So it's you got to figure out what pieces are appropriate to plug in here and what pieces are appropriate to let go of. And that's where we see officers struggle a lot because they're they're trying to go down each step and try to show us that they can do it. Like, man, we get that you can already do it. We want to see you be able to uh, morph it to what we're asking you to morph it to. So awesome. One, two over to you. So um, you rated it a 10. So what about the what about the week was so mentally difficult and uh, how would you suggest people prep for it? Yeah, Charlie, one, two. I think, uh, yeah, mentally, it's obviously the most difficult thing I had to do in my life uh, just because of the situation that you're going to be put in. You just can't get through an event. You have to perform well, and that pressure is always going to be there. You can't you can't sit back. You can't just wait for the next thing to happen. You're going to be challenged. You're going to be tested. You're going to have to explain your thought process, uh, and it's going to be extremely uncomfortable. There are definitely times where you get asked a question in front of a lot of people, and you have to come up with a with an answer on the spot and explain your reasoning. And that, I think that that creates the mental the mental toughness there and you got to be able to step outside your comfort zone and your limitations you set on yourself what charlie one one was alluding to when it comes to tlps and some of these problem solving events we're, we're asked to do things and solve problems that they don't really have an answer to you just have to be able to stand behind why you gave it an answer with some creativity and and, and kind of stick to your guns and explain explain your thought process and reasoning how would you suggest guys go about preparing for that I think preparation for this, uh, problem solving preparation, if you could just get get to uh, experience some scenarios where you have to think through things and like I said, outside the box, getting outside those limitations when it comes to analogies on this, there's, you know, there's world records that stand for 50 years. And when somebody breaks that world record, it gets broken three times the next year. So you just really have to understand that there's, there's not a solution to something, there's, there's always more to it. And then kind of relating that to uh, to drive as well to build that mental toughness. Drive is probably the one of the, one of the traits I would say is the least trainable. Uh, but when you're looking at the the facets behind drive, initiative, persistence, reliability, those are things that you could build um, on a daily basis. Set little goals and tasks for yourself. And every time you do all those tasks, you're building drive. Every time you fail to do one of those tasks in a day, you're losing drive. So that'd be my my recommendation to train your mentality. Yeah, I love it. And I just want, I've said this before, I will keep saying it for all of you military folks out there who just assume that you're good at problem solving because you're good at your skill set. Uh, very rarely in the military do we really get a novel problem to solve. Really what you're doing is just plugging in an algorithm that you were taught or plugging in data to a format that you were taught. So do not confuse being good at problem solving with being good at your job. Yes, there is a little bit crossover there, but I think guys realize when they get here quickly that um, that is not enough. You need to do something above and beyond just coming into work and doing your skill set every day to be a really good problem solver. So 4-4, four, four, over to you. So the question is, you gave it a 10, the mental difficulty of the week. So describe that a little bit and then what you would suggest to people to get better at um, surviving the mental difficulty. I think the, the most challenging, I guess, why I put it at a 10 for the environment throughout the week, you know, I think it's kind of ties into that environment that the whole staff and, you know, uh, ANS uh, cadre create with it. Um, you know, every event that you're doing is mentally taxing on you, especially as the week progresses. Um, you know, when you kind of get less and less and less sleep and, you know, a lot of those anxiety and those nerves are jacking up with you uh, as the week progresses. Um, you know, every event forces you to bit, use every bit of your brain power. And you know that as the week goes on, you're getting less and less opportunities to be able to present yourself and present your skills and your attributes to, you know, the ANS staff to show them why you belong here. Um, and, you know, and the staff always in the background, you know, chirping about, you know, quote unquote, how great you guys are doing, you know, that always adds to that little bit of stress level uh, coming in for you. Um, and I think to tie it all into what one, one said earlier was, you know, you want to be here like this. You wouldn't have put in your packet if you didn't want to work here at this organization. And so you already have a decent amount of stress kind of built in because you want to be here so much because you care so much. Um, and that's, you know, subsequently just increases your stress level overall, you know, as this week uh, progresses and goes through. Um, but what I would say for guys, if they want to prepare, uh, you know, at home before they get here, you know, as you're doing whatever little problem sets that you do in your daily life, you know, as you're going uh, and living it, 
you know, whatever you come up with first, you know, if you've got some sort of problem or some sort of, you know, idea that you have to solve at home, the first idea that you come up with, you can't use that. You know, don't, don't, that's what you're most comfortable with. You know, I think we've all listened to the podcast about problem solving, you know, building those train tracks, you know, you've, you've already got those train tracks built, you know, from that station to the next one. So don't use it, you know, and maybe how long is it going to take you to come up with the second problem set? and figure that out, maybe not even use that one again, you know, and really force yourself to try and come up with these new and creative ways of solving problems for yourself that you definitely are not used to. And I think that's going to be able to help guys get a little bit more creative and get outside of their, that box that they might be constrained to. Dude, I love it. Good tip. Four, eight over to you. So you rated it an eight. So why, um, why was this week mentally tough for you? And what would you suggest guys do to uh, prepare for it? Yeah, so I'll, I'll defend this eight, I guess, versus all these tens that we were given. <laughs> um, so Charlie four, eight, um, I left those two points off solely just because of the team aspect. Um, I think there were at certain times I didn't really have to think about, uh, much, whether I was, you know, doing good enough or how bad it hurt or whether or not the cadre, you know, thought good or bad of me. Um, I was just solely focused on the dudes next to me um, and getting them getting them to the end goal. Um, for for dudes coming through or wanting to be up here and come to through A and S, my tip would be to one be obviously physically fit. Um, I think that gives you a lot of mental bandwidth up here um, because the physical events aren't really what you guys are looking for up here. In my opinion, like you're expected to be physically fit when you come up here. Um, but what being physically fit does for you is give you that mental bandwidth to do the MDMP, problem solve, things like that. Good. I'm going to read a comment from um, the feedback that was given. This is from Charlie three one. So it's going to tie in a little bit of what y'all are talking about, specifically the drive pieces that a couple of you have mentioned one, two, you started it off, but, um, uh, how drive, if you have drive, you can overcome almost anything if it's inherent in you. And if you if you notice or you ever get, like I read a lot of feedbacks this week where guys were saying, I thought drive was my biggest attribute. And then I was getting hit for it all week by my peers saying, um, you need to increase it. So beautiful self-awareness. But here's what 3-1 said. The biggest mental challenge for me was the infill ruck. My feet going into the vent were banged up from previous event and rain. They got rained on on land nav as well as a good bit of chafing. Not certain what was going on physiologically, but after the second lap, my body felt like it was trying to shut down. Staying awake, conscious, took 90% of my brain power, which didn't leave me much for the event. I never experienced that before. Knowing that I could overcome it mentally was reassuring. Of all the training I did to prepare for selection, rucking was the biggest focus. So being in that condition and not being able to perform was extremely defeating. So imagine that, man. Um, not only did you, he hit a mental low point, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, um, get y'all's four experiences, but it was the second freaking lap. Uh, you got the whole night ahead of you at that point in time. So yeah, I talked to him a little bit about it yesterday, but his drive, like without drive, you're done, done. Second lap, you got the whole night to go, uh, done. So I do think drive is a big part of overcoming those mental challenges, but it also highlights if, if you're high on drive, you'll do the prep work necessary before you get here or do other challenging things in your life. So um, I love it. I'm not trying to guide all, us all to, hey, drive is the ultimate answer. It's not, but it helps. All right, y'all. So we're going to start with, uh, let's go down to 4.8 for this one. So similarly, I asked you to rate the physical dif difficulty of selection. So again, we went 10, 10, 10, and 7. So 4.8 is the oddball again. But I think I know why, but I'm interested to hear. That's why I'm going to start with him. So 4.8. Riff a little bit on why you gave it a seven, and then um, how you would suggest guys in your same position um, would prep before they get up here. Yeah, I gave it a seven because in the first phase of the assessment, I didn't think it was like terrible. Um, obviously, some parts of the combine required a lot out of you um, if you were putting out, um, but not overall terrible. Now, the second phase, I would absolutely give it a 10 out of 10 physically. Um, Man, that was, it was a battle between no sleep and crappy hydration and nutrition um, and just physically demanding everything out of you. Um, and then just because I just took it as an average, really, average of the two. 
Um, that's why I gave it a seven. Uh, I'm looking out at the folks that are going to come up in future years for a, what should they be doing? What should they do to physically prep? Yeah, I, I would just put, you know, a lot of, a lot of miles with a heavy ruck on your back, um, with, you know, load in your hand, you're going to be doing a lot of that. Your grip's going to be absolutely shot, um, from the get go. Um, I know dudes that I asked for advice when I was coming up here, that's, that was like the common theme was put heavy weight on your back and put heavy weight in your hand and go for quarter mile, then go for half a mile and then go for mile. Um, and just do those things. Obviously don't do so much that you're, you're hurting yourself before you come up to selection, but you want to get those baselines in before you come up here. I won't reveal how far you guys move when we go into phase three, um, including land nav, but, um, it's a long way. We used to have dudes with biofeedback hooked up to them. Um, so we kind of know the distance we wanted to know, but again, uh, some guys traveled less distance than other guys, right? So, um, that's where that drive comes in too. We can look at a, just a distance measurement and tell your drive on a lot of things, but yeah, I like it that get, get weight on your joints and your body and get used to carrying that weight because nothing you do in phase three usually is without that rucksack on and that rucksack's heavy. So I like it. One, one over to you. So, you rated it a 10. Um, riff a little bit on the physical difficulty and how you would prepare, or suggest others prepare if you had to do it again. Yeah, one, one here. I really like what uh, four eight said about, you know, you do have to kind of separate out the, the phases. However, in my opinion, when you bring that all holistically together, it is definitely a 10. Um, Cause by the rate phase three, I'd say it was more than 10. So my average would increase. <laughs> um, and that's really due to a combination towards the end there of that lack of sleep. Um, and that, like we just talked about that mental decline, like your, your brain is going, working so hard. And a lot of times if, if you're fresh in your brain, you can diagnose, okay, I'm not doing this great. I'm not doing this great. I got to increase here. But a lot of guys, sometimes you're not thinking of what might be ahead and maybe your hydration or your nutrition slips a little bit. And then that affects you physically too, because you're just not operating on all levels. So it was one of the hardest things I've had to do. And one of the, like, I pushed beyond limits that I, I didn't think I could push beyond. And uh, I knew somewhat what to expect coming in here, listen to podcasts, listen to experiences. But when you're in it and you, you kind of stop and realize just how far you think you may have went and what you just did, it's, it's beyond anything you wouldn't, you wouldn't have like taken that and trained that back home. If you said, you know, X miles with this much weight and this much stuff you're carrying, you wouldn't have done it uh, just because you would have been like, that. I, that's ridiculous. It doesn't take me all day. And then for, trying to give some advice to dudes coming in the process. I, I think I won't spend a lot of time about the, the, the specific physical prep just because you can always be more physically fit. There's never a limit of like, okay, I'm too physically fit. Like if you think you're good, you got to keep going further. The one thing I would say to prioritize and it's, you, you got to balance it because you do need to be smart about your training. But one of the things I'd really say is you have to train on your bad days. If you're feeling sore, if you're feeling tired, or like you just had an exercise you went to in your daily job or all night, go out and train, throw on a rucksack and see how far you can go in that environment. Cause you're never going to have an event here where you're fresh. Like everyone at home, like I know I did it most of the time would be fresh, night, good night of sleep and go train, go do my ruck and come back and go, all right, I felt pretty good on that. You're never going to be in that, in that headspace. You're going to be grinded down and that's when you're asked to perform. So you got to, you got to be used to that. I'm going to throw this out there. So in that long distance hiking community, which very few people probably know much about, um, that is exactly why it's so tough is because everybody thinks about it's going to be the sunny day and you're going to be on mountaintops and the flowers are blooming and butterflies are flying everywhere. Um, those days are good, uh, but I don't remember many of those days. What I remember are the ones you're talking about where it rained all day the day before. Everything you have is damp or wet. You didn't get good sleep. And you got to pack it all up and you're a hundred miles from town. So you have no choice. If you want to practice what he's talking about, just go find a long distance trail, take a week, week of leave, or maybe somebody will pay you, you know, TDY money to go do it. And don't come off that trail for about four or five days, carrying everything that you need. And it will force you into the highs and lows, mentally, physically, the weather, everything. So just go experience that right there with a heavy ruck on. And it's going to prep you a little bit mentally to, 
to get at this, um, which also ties over to the physical, uh, the physical difficulty. No, one, two, so over to you. So you rated it a 10. Um, let's talk about why you gave it that difficulty and how you would uh, maybe prep differently if you came back up or what you would suggest others do. Yeah, simply gave it a 10 because it's by far physically the, the most I ever had to do in that short amount of time. Um, especially through any training that I've done in the military, there's never been a, a, a three day period, especially in that, that phase three where we're, we're putting that many miles on our body. We're being asked to do a lot and then you're being asked to do more on top of that. I think it was, it, it was very challenging the entire process uh, from, a, from a physical aspect. And when it comes to uh, preparation uh, specifically for, for this, I don't think there's any like secret code. There's no, it, it's an open book up here. You just got to get on that website. You got to use those resources and that's your preparation. Follow that to a T. And then I really like what one one said is maybe follow that program, but then build some of those workouts in the very uncomfortable times. Uh, this, those rocks on Saturdays, I can't tell you how many times I didn't want to do it. And that was just on the, the best conditions, waking up with a normal full night's rest, going to start a rock at six or seven in the morning and going for a rock in two or three hours is great, but try that on a Saturday at two in the morning when go to sleep at a normal time, wake up at two in the morning and go do that. When, when it's dark outside, it's uncomfortable. It might be cold depending on the time of the year or it might be extremely hot. Uh, and then also from a physical aspect, I think we maybe wave topped it, but nutrition, uh, practice, practice moving and practice eating and continue to move. Cause it doesn't matter how good a shape you're in. If you're not fueling your body, you're going to hit a wall and you're not going to be able to keep going. You could be the most in shape person in this entire process and, You'll, you'll go down. So you need, you need to kind of learn where your limitations are with your body and know when to fuel and uh, how to hydrate properly so you can keep going. One, two, I know you're a positive guy, so this is going to be difficult for you. Um, I know Coach Curtis did a lot of good stuff for you prepping for the process. Um, he's one of our strength coaches for the audience. Uh, give some critique. What did he leave out of that plan and you were going through selection? You're like, it, man, I'm pretty weak here. This hurts more than it should. Uh, what was the piece that he should put in that workout plan? I think I'll, I'll probably just resort back to the that nutrition side of it and just uh, and then working out in those uncomfortable times. I think the the plan should probably include timelines and when you should try to execute these things throughout the day or at least uh, where you're going to step into this workout um, from a from a physical standpoint. I think it's it's very built around being structured with having proper recovery, having proper sleep, uh, maybe maybe just like one week out of that four week training plan uh, or that four week snippet, because it's a 12, well, at least I, I followed a 12 week plan, but maybe one week every four weeks, you're kind of testing your body a little differently as opposed to just going to the gym at this time to this time, because you're kind of building a routine for your body, you're getting used to it. And when, I, when you come here, I can 100% guarantee you there's not gonna be a routine that you're used to. It's, it's going to be well outside of that. So getting outside of those, those boundaries is, I think is going to make the difference. Yeah. Sounds good. Hey, I like, man, I like everything that you just said there. And I think we haven't talked about that on the podcast before of, um, and you gotta be careful with this, but if you keep working out in perfect conditions, you're not going to be prepared for what you're going to face here. So how can you get some professionals the professionals that surround you, and come up with a plan on how to work in some deficits, whether that's nutritionally, sleep, you got to experience all of it. So you at least understand what your body's going to do. So you don't get like three, one who on lap two, um, now all of a sudden everything's breaking down and you just started the event, the hard, one of the hardest events that we do. So love it. I think that is, we could do a whole podcast on that. Maybe I'll get with the coaches and our nutritionists and everybody else and, and think through that and maybe get some info out there. Four, four over to you. So you gave it a 10. Why'd you give it a 10 and um, what are some things that you think guys should do to prepare? Uh, I gave the, you know, physical difficulty for this 10 strictly because of field face, um, you know, tying into a little bit of what four, eight said, you know, in kind of the garrison phase, you know, you do some workouts and, you know, like he said, as long as you've had a little bit of that drive and you've prepared coming in, it's, you know, yeah, the, the echo bike sucks, but it's, it's manageable. Like, you know, you can get through that and you can recover. Um, but you know, once field hits and it's just nonstop for, you know, 48 plus hours, you know, minimal sleep, you know, everyone loves eating, you know, they've got their special meal back home that can hydrate them, and, you know, get them ready, refuel them. 
you know, no, you're getting the cold, you know, spinach, fettuccine, Alfredo, MRE, that's all you got. Like, you know, what's that going to do, you know, physically for you? It's not going to be fuel you as good. So you got to learn to push through that. Um, you know, I'm thinking about it as well as, you know, all the events that you do, the order of the events, all those other outside stressors, you know, that's what really pushed, you know, my physical exhaustion, you know, pretty much to that 10, you know, it's as you know, you're going through it and you're on that infill and then you do everything the next day and then you're getting on exfil. You know, my legs were certainly feeling it. You know, it was, it was very hard to just keep, keep one leg going in front of the other. You know, they just felt like they wanted to just give up and break down on me. So love it. Good stuff. I think man, the, the, words that went through my head when you were describing the nutrition part and having to eat cold MREs is um, back home, we're normally training like we're elite athletes, which is cool. And what a privilege we get to have the things that the Air Force is surrounding us with. Uh, but you come where, somewhere like this, man, you got to know how to live like a cockroach um, where you can eat anything and still push forward. And we don't do that a lot. Um, we're more like elite athletes and we need to, I like what one, two said, maybe a week out of every four, man, you got to live like a cockroach and see what that's going to do to your body. Okay, cool, man. Let's go over to one, two. We'll start with you for this one. Um, and this is probably a little bit hard for you coming in here because you're already at the organization, but what was the relationship like between the evaluators and staff and you guys as the candidates? Yeah, Charlie, one, two, obviously it was, uh, it was very awkward getting into the first few days, seeing a lot of familiar faces, kind of not knowing how the reactions were going to be, but man, it was so professional. It was a very, just a professional environment from start to finish. And I think objectively everyone got the same, was afforded the same opportunity. Cause I know obviously if, if there would have been day one guys acting like they knew me or treating me differently or something that was going to affect the way my peers felt about me. So they really stepped back and, and treated that, that process very professional it helped out with uh my peer evaluations essentially because i didn't want anyone to think that or think i was better than anyone and i try to treat that process exactly the same professional no matter what event i was going into i was going to go 110 thousand percent uh just because i didn't i don't want to like have any doubt in anyone's mind that i was treating this like uh i already had it or I've done this before. They've already seen me do this. They see me do the echo bike before they see me run a 300. They know what my time is. It didn't matter because in that moment, I still had to perform uh, for, for the candidates around me. So I feel like it was a very, very fair and balanced uh, professional environment from start to finish. I don't envy you, man, because um, there's also expectations that come in with you because people know you too. So you're, we don't have expectations of anybody else, but there was expectations of you rightly or wrongly. So that's other biases we had to work through too, as you started going, if you started doing poorly in an, in an environment, man, keeping, keeping the evaluators in check of, uh, man, let go of the expectations. He's, he's having to go through the pain and suffering just like everybody else. So just let him have the experience and just rate what you see. So I liked it. I'm glad you got selected at the end, man. I think, um, I think we got it right. So we're going to go in reverse order here. So one, one over to you. Um, What's that relationship like between the evaluator staff and the candidates and how is that different than what you've experienced in previous experience? Yeah, one, one here, I'll echo the extreme professionalism. I, I think he hit on the head, so I won't um, beat it up too much more, but the one fine thing I'd say is it was so professional that it was almost suspect at times. Like you felt like you might be tricked. Um, like why are these guys being nice to me or just being good dudes? Um, but it's because they have a genuine interest in getting to know you and know who you are and know how you think and how you operate because that's what they're looking for they have a specific person they're looking to come up here and they're not asking you questions about where you're from or you know what unit you had to <clears throat> try and trip you up they're just genuinely curious so uh and they manage it super well they don't show favoritism they don't they're just all around very very professional individuals i would say it's different um there's no uh, pointless screaming or yelling to add additional stress like every single event in here like even if it's a written assignment that no one's watching you there's an element of stress to that because you don't know who's going to read it you don't know are we going to have to come in and present it you don't know anything about that um so they don't need to add in extra stress by just yelling they'll add in stress by just asking you a question that you now reevaluate all your decisions about such process and then the last thing was just that every single piece of the selection in my opinion, it looked like had a purpose. 
it was specifically formulated to show the attributes that the cadre and the staff were looking for. It didn't seem like there was any, I mean, all of us hated the rice and I got dumped, I had to dump mine multiple times, but even that had a, had a purpose to measure your drive. Are you still going to keep looking at that rice uh, when you're, every time you look at a piece, you can't tell the difference between the colors and you're falling asleep. So that's how I thought it was different. I just want to, and I'm just giving this as an example, not because I was involved in it, but um, kind of going back to what he was saying about how the cadre are invested in, in trying to be good guys. Uh, one, one got done with an event and, if you don't know one, one man, he's just a very personable guy. He likes people. Um, I didn't know him from Adam, but I can tell that instantly. And he got done with an event where he wasn't really, it just didn't feel genuine. Um, where if he would use his, that attribute of liking people and, and being a good people person and caring about people, uh, he would have done amazing at the event. But for some reason he chose a different path, um, when he came in and approached, uh, the commander that he had to engage with. So I just questioned him after, um, I asked him why he chose that and just try to nudge him towards don't ever give up the chance to use your strengths in a situation like that because it he didn't score well in that event because if he'd used his strengths, man, he would have knocked it out of the park. Uh, so anyway, we're going to nudge you all the way through and, and try to coach you a little bit um, inside the process to make you a better version of you. So that was just an example. We do care. Uh, I don't get a choice. The evaluators don't get a choice on who gets hired or fired. We just want you guys to be better when you leave here. So it's a cool environment. All right, four eight. What was the relationship like between you and the evaluators and the staff? How was that different than other experiences you had in the past? Yeah. So coming in, um, obviously these your evaluators are at the at the unit. Um, they're operators who have tons of experience, um, and so that kind of adds a level of stress. Um, all on its own that you want to impress them and you want to uh, show them that you belong. Um, but I'll echo, you know, what the last two have said, it's completely professional. Um, they are there to simply evaluate you and um, they're not, they're not looking at your past. They're not looking, you know, what you've done at your unit or whatever. Like they're there to, evaluate what you bring to the table at, you know, through the eight days that you're going to be here. Obviously, I went through a and uh, approximately a little over three years ago. Um, so, well, four years ago. And, you know, like one one said, there's a lot of just nonsense of yelling and screaming and just because that's the level of stress that they put on you. It's, there's not like, you know, the mission planning and all that that they can put on you at that point because you just, you're so new. Um, so they add that yelling and screaming in there to add that level of stress. So there's none of that here. And they they tell you that from the very get go that they're not going to do that. So don't expect it. And they're not going to play games. Like they want you to succeed and they give you all the, they, they try and give you all the answers up front. So um, I just think that that was completely professional and I knew the standard going in. Love it. Over to you, 4-4. I mean, as far as when you look at past, you know, ANS or selection experiences, um, for myself, I went through INDOC and, you know, kind of tying into a little bit what 1-1 and 4-8 said, you know, you go through that. And a lot more yelling, you know, they're, I think, just kind of testing, you know, that mental side, like, do you want to be here? And I think there's a little bit more physically. Um, you know, that what they're really trying to test, are you going to hold up through all these events? Um, as far as what the ANS staff here at the organization kind of brought forth during this ANS process, you know, at Echo, you know, the prior guys, it's not that yelling, you know, they're not trying to throw in that kind of stress, you know, they're, you know, yeah, it's physically demanding and we want to see that physical performance, but I think it's a little bit more mentally demanding and they're trying to see how, how you think, how you problem solve, how you rebound from some of these, you know, failures that you might have. And like, how's that going to motivate you going forward? Um, but, you know, I also look at it, you know, they're also evaluating you on just who you are as a person. You know, if you get selected, you know, and then you go through OTC and you make it through OTC, like you're going to be working with these guys. You know, you're going to be friends with these guys. So while they are assessing your mental abilities and cognitive you know, strengths and weaknesses, they are just asking you questions, 
trying to make, you know, honest chit chat, and, you know, build some sort of a rapport because in the future you guys could be teammates and friends and they want to see like, can I see myself, you know, hanging out with this guy in a couple of years when he's done, you know, you know, it, what is he going to bring to the table as far as, you know, that team environment, you know, where can he fit in? Um, so yeah, while they're assessing your, you know, all of your strengths for the attributes that you guys are looking for here at the organization, they just want to see if you're a good dude who can have an honest conversation, and just re be relatable. Yeah, good. Uh, this is going to be weird. I know y'all are in a weird position when you come up because, um, and this is what I'm trying to get across to the audience with this question too. If you come up and every time uh, one of your evaluators comes up and tries to close the gap with you and you're still kind of, you know, uh, you go to parade rest and you're kind of um, military-ish and you're not breaking through and letting them get in, and they're not going to be able to see who you really are, man, and they're probably not going to take a chance on you. So it's hard. It's hard to overcome the Lackland bias to come up here and just trust that they're just trying to be a good human and get to know you. Uh, because that getting to know you, like 404 said, is the ability then for them to be able to see your more natural behaviors and see if you're a good fit for the organization. So if you're not willing to do that or if it's harder for you because you're an introvert, you got to figure that out really quick because it's in a long process. So thanks, guys. I appreciate y'all doing that. OK, so let's go with 404. Um, we're going to stick with you. So let's talk about those low points. Uh, I think as we move into a process like this and our fears start getting the best of us, um, we're all worried about, can I survive the lowest points? Uh, so when did you hit your lowest point and how did you, how did you keep moving forward? You know, as far as that lowest point, you know, I feel like a lot of guys are going to have similar answers. Um, but for me, it was the infill. Uh, you know, we had very minimal sleep the night before, went right into pretty much, you know, like 24 hours of physical activity, you know, with land nav and stuff that day. And really was really was trying to push through, you know, all those pains and all those sufferings that, you know, you're feeling trying to you feel yourself going into the pain cave, but you want to pull yourself back out. Um, you know, I look at it, I rucking has never been one of my better uh, you know, strengths and events to do. So slightly dreading going into that. Um you know, right before the infill ruck, you know, you get some poor feedback, you know, just kind of told all the things I was doing wrong, you know, during the week. And, you know, now you got to sit and you got to stew on that before you just go walk by yourself in the middle of the night just to leave all those thoughts just between you and yourself. And you're not allowed to talk to anybody else. So, you know, that really brought me down a good bit and just trying to you know, acknowledge, I'd think back to the podcast, you know, you got to think about the stress, you know, acknowledge the stress that you're, that's being placed on you, you know, accept it. And then, you know, somehow channel that going towards a positive. And for me, it was just kind of holding on to that. Why, um, you know, why was I here? Why did I join, you know, bringing all that kind of full circle and saying, you know, yeah, you've done some bad things, but let's go forward and let's keep giving this, you know, our best shot. So for me, that's, it was the infill rock. That was, that was a pretty bad, bad spot for me. Yeah. I love, I love talking about this. And I told you guys on day one that um, married dudes have a tough time, or at least I perceive that they have a tough time because they're usually the ones that will um, think the hardest about maybe just dropping out uh, because during that, those hard times and usually on infill, they convince themselves that, okay, maybe this isn't the best choice for my family. And uh, what I told y'all was it's just a funny thing because it was the right choice all the way up until you got on infill, right? And and the demons came calling and there's it doesn't feel like there's a way out of anything. And really, it's just a beautiful example of how your mind will play tricks on you where it was the right call all the way up until that moment. And then if you had just survived it, it would have been the right call again to come through that process. Uh, but you gave in during those dark moments. So perfect that you leaned on that why and it's amazing how strong that that resource is if you use it effectively so i appreciate that experience for four one one over to you so what was the lowest moment how'd you keep pushing yeah one one here obviously you know infill i was what i was going to go with first and i'll just hit a couple of key points on that but it's not my, my lowest but that one like you already alluded to the demons come in you got some weird stuff going on you're so tired you're starting to see some things uh, I never knew I could sleepwalk with a ruck on. Um, 
but it happens. So that's obviously challenging, but looking deeper, I think my lowest mental point was following our field mission brief. Um, and the reason being is infill is a personal, like if you let yourself down personally, <clears throat> that's one thing and you, you got to figure out how to recover from that. But my entire job and role as a, as an officer is to make sure that I don't let the team down and that I, they are set up for success in any way that they need to drive forward. And we put together this mission brief. I was proud of how hard the, the guys worked. I thought we were giving, uh, giving it our all and kind of in, in moving our direction. And then boy, did we get torn to shreds. Um, and ultimately like, that's not a time to start pointing fingers. Like you point the finger at yourself and go, look, no matter how bad that brief was, it's, it's my fault. Cause I could have changed it. I could have given the order to redo it or start from scratch. And I did not. So that's, that's tough when you let others down. Um, <clears throat> so you got to take, take a step back. You know, I took a short pause after that reflected gains, like did some mental lessons learned, asked for some feedback. That's kind of what really, I think helped bring me out of it was asking for some feedback of like, Hey, what I do, right. What I do wrong. There was some, some good lessons learned there. And then just getting off the ropes, getting off the canvas and getting ready to get back in the fight again. Like you can't, you can't retreat. You got to be ready to put yourself right back out there and show that perseverance. Yeah, it's good. Just so we can, uh, man, I enjoyed what you tried to do in the mission planning, by the way, the pitcher idea I bought into instantly. Um, and nobody knows what the hell we're talking about on here. So that's why I don't mind talking about it. Uh, the problem with the pitcher thing was once you ask one question to the dude briefing that slide, they didn't have an answer deeper than, than the first question. Right. So that's where it fell off the tracks, but the pitcher concept is a freaking key, man. Like that's a, we need to come up with a new MDMP, whatever we want to call that, that picture model that you came up with and you need to keep developing it. Cause it's pretty, it's pretty cool. You, uh, the, my last couple brain cells were used effectively when, uh, we shot down a different idea that <laughs> you would have hated We're gonna <laughs> maybe do a act out the scenario, which I don't think would have went well. Yeah, no, I'm glad you didn't do that. Um, <laughs> one, two over to you lowest moment. How'd you get out of it? Uh, lowest moment for me was definitely like the first, the beginning of Xville. Um, I knew it was the last event. Kind of the, the the process was relatively open to that. You know, you're going into it like this is it. Let's push out. But I kept thinking about the end. But when we, when they started in the beginning, I was just thinking about how many laps we were going to do, how long it was going to take, and that really didn't let me live in the moment and perform. And I know. I didn't do so hot starting out in that event and I was feeling sorry for myself because of the infill. I'm like, I put a lot of miles on my legs and hurting and I really had to dig deep. And like we alluded to, you're going to have those thoughts. I don't care who you are. I was able to hold it off for a while, but eventually you're going to have a thoughts that are, uh, that are questioning why you're there, why you want to be here. I don't know if I want to do this. And really what got me kind of through it was just, seeing other guys just keep going. And I look at the guy next to me, some of the guys that I, I was doing better than earlier were, were crushing it and were ahead of me. And I'm like, that guy's still doing it. I'm still here. And that kind of kept me going, but that was, that was definitely the lowest point for me was, was coming out of that rut. Yeah. Love to hear that story, man. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. All right. Before we over to you, uh, I will echo in Phil. Um, for me, I went out really hot and it, I absolutely blew up. My feet just got destroyed. Um, I went from running to barely walking. So that was cool. And every bad thought came through my mind over that course of that infill of the fact that it's like my feet are so torn up. Like, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to do X fill now. Like all those thoughts about them saying, or you saying like, you got to make it to the end to get picked up type thing. It's like, man, every one of those thoughts went my mind, not to mention the fact that, you know, you're having hallucinations. You're, I was literally falling asleep in the middle of the road, just standing still. Um, all those things just built on top of one another. And yeah, you, you got to really just set goals. So for me, like, I had a goal of laps in my mind that I wanted to do. Um, and I tried hitting that goal. I don't think I did hit it, but um, you, you got to have something that's set out in front of you, whether it's 
the next crack in the road. It's the next turn in the road, whether it's a number of laps. Like, I think for me, that was how I got through it. But um, yeah, mentally, it was the infield just because all the, the bad thoughts that were going through my head. I love it. And this reminds me, I'm not going to say the candidate's number, but when we started Xfield on the first jerry can sprint, you know, you go up the, the hill and then they got the curves and then you come over to the big open spaces. It opens up to your left. Um, I always watch because I can tell where people are mentally in that rep by what they do when that open space hits. It's the guys who start looking around and they're just hoping they can get a glimpse glimpse of the, the checkpoint, right? Like what down there looks like somebody waiting for me to stop. And there is none. There is no view of a checkpoint anywhere. And I told one guy, he kept looking. I was like, dude, just look down at the ground, pick a spot in front of you and go. Uh, because that's all you have. That's all you have mentally. Uh, just like 4-8 just said. Um, your world is reduced down to picking something in front of you that you can see and making it to that point and then picking something else and making it to that point over and over again for hours and hours. And it sounds like a crazy world, but that's just how you have to do it to survive mentally out there because it freaking blows at times. All right, so we're winding this down. This is really going to be our last full question before we wrap it up. So let's start with 4-8. We're going to stick with you. So if you could go, if you could have one event in selection, just one event that you go back and do over. Which one would be and why? Yeah, um, this was a kind of a hard one. Obviously, there's a lot of things that I wish I could go back and do. But I think the big thing when you think about special operations in general is what, what we do is we do the, the, the little things right. We do the basics right. Um, and there was a certain event where all you had to do was carry, carry a kettlebell and remember a certain number. And uh, I failed to do that. I failed to remember that number and uh in the correct order anyways so i i just think like for me i was so disappointed in myself because that's what we pride ourselves in is doing the little things right and that was such a little thing that uh i should have done right and i didn't yeah for me that's the one i know it's it's kind of silly but like i would go back and do that one again just because it was just so simple i should have done it right the first time yeah, good. Uh, I like hearing that experience. I watched another candidate. Um, he he had already done two numbers and he came down and he was making his turn. You know how you got to come down, cross over line and go back with a kettlebell, which really sucks. He stopped at the line. He just stopped. He's holding the kettlebell. He didn't set him down. He's looking down at the numbers and he just holds his head down. He's like, shit. And you can already tell he chose the wrong number on the first one because he got the order wrong. So now what do you do? He's got to just go walk random numbers that he knows are wrong, but he's still got to do it because the event isn't over yet. So now he's just making worthless laps because he screwed it up. So fun to watch that event. And I kind of suck at that too. I'm trying to think every time y'all do that event, I'm trying to think, how am I keeping those numbers in my head? Because it sounds easy to everybody that's out there fresh um, and your prefrontal cortex is energized right now. But when it's not, freaking coming up with a way to remember things is is critical in what we do for the nation. So Love it. One, one over to you. Um, what is that one event you want to go back over or do over and why? The event I'd like to go do over is infill. Um, it, you know, there's so much leading up to it and decisions were made at fueling wasn't as great as it should have been. Hydration wasn't as great as it should have been. And you just see like, that was the most clear time I could see exactly the effect effect it had. And like when you're in it, and you're walking and you eat a bag of M&Ms to feel that juice that hits you, like it just all puts in a context like, dang, if I could have smashed two MRE entrees before this event, I wonder where I would, would have been at. And it, it, we were just all down pretty bad. Like feet were on fire, shoulders, like it was just a, it was a mess. And it, it sucks because I know I've, I've, I've gone further than that in training. I could go further than that. And like we alluded to earlier about, about training in bad times, just hadn't taken into account the land nav where you're sprinting through the woods and almost breaking your ankle, stepping in a murder hole out here, um, leading up to one of the hardest events ever. So my expectations for myself were not met, and I just wish I could have gone further. Um, so that's one event I'd like to have back. Love the description. I love you tying in nutrition, hydration again with this. I remember on Xville. Um, towards the end, uh, everybody's kind of beat down, and I look over at you, and you're shoving. I think it was a jalapeno ham something. What is that thing you were eating? That's that jalapeno beef patty. It's a uh, top tier. 
<laughs> yeah. So you don't have much of a choice at that point. You just have what you have left and you've probably been saving that because you didn't want to eat the damn thing. And now uh, you just everybody needs to understand the fuel sources that you're using in events like that and just know that if you're saving the high protein thing for the end of something where um, you need some quick calories that ain't going to turn into quick calories when it hits your system so understanding all that too knowing that one one probably didn't have one thing left in his cargo pockets at that point though uh, you're just going to shove in what you got but what the guys have been saying this whole time too is understanding what you need through those phases and what fuel source your body's going to burn first, man, it's really important to understand all of that as you go through and know if you only got the jalapeno, whatever, um, beef patty, just know that, man, you're not going to get a kick like you do from those M&Ms and uh, you're still going to be struggling after you eat that nasty thing. So anyway, it was entertaining. Let's go over to one, two. So um, one event, you can go back and do over, what would it be and why? I kind of struggled with this. Uh, sorry, Charlie, one, two. Yeah, I struggled with this thought process because I don't think I'd want to redo anything physically. So uh, kudos to you, one one for want to redo infill. I would not want to do that. But I think for me, the what hurt my pride probably the most was the land nav, uh, just by the my performance there. But I'm actually going to default to the individual mission planning with the the ground force commander. I think that one probably hurt me the most. I was disappointed because I focused more on my strengths than my weaknesses going into it, and I feel like my strengths were interpersonal. And I could go in there and get the ground force commander to talk to me and we can have a conversation. But my weakness is problem solving and I did not have a good plan. So once he started going past that, that level one to this level two and three details, I really, I fell apart and I just couldn't, there was so many things I overlooked because I just wasn't thinking about solving the problem. I was thinking about talking, talking to the ground force commander and I left that and I was very disappointed and it, it did affect me going into the next event and I really had to compartmentalize it and push it behind me so I could continue to perform so it didn't affect me for the rest of the week. Awesome. Good experience, man. Thanks. 4-4, four, four, round us out. Going back, um, I think it was right after infill. Uh, it was a problem-solving event uh, as a team. Um, you know, not to get too descriptive here on the podcast uh, but for people out there, but I believe it was at the shoot house. And, you know, the problem set was, you know, we as a team, we all had to move through uh, in a very specific way to one specific room of the shoot house and accomplish, you know, a mission. Uh, on one of the iterations of that, I got put in charge. Um, you know, we had talked about some ways of doing it, and I went with those ways. I had another way in my gut that I wanted to try, and I didn't do that. And, you know, as we started fumbling around and eventually working our way through that original problem, you know, going through the solution that I came up with first, just kind of realized that ah, this, this didn't work, you know, didn't feel too hot in the moment there and looked kind of dumb, I think, uh, you know, and cadre asking questions about it. It's like, oh, darn it. You know, this didn't, this wasn't what I wanted to happen. Um, and I feel like if I would have just kind of gone with my gut choice there at the beginning, uh, I think we could have made it a lot farther uh, through that problem set. Um, and that one kind of eats at me still. Wish I could have that one back. Yeah, I appreciate that, 4-4. That is a tough event. All right, guys, so I appreciate it so much for y'all coming on. Let's go around the horn real quick, starting with 1-1, and just um, as we close out here, just uh, give me a just quick glimpse of why somebody should just come up here and, and get over their fears and all the things holding them back. I, I don't see there as being a good reason not to come up here. Um, if if you're a competitive person, if you if you want to do why you join the military, if you want to act on those those impulses and those um, those objectives, those goals you set for yourself, there's no place better than to come up here. Um, being in the team room, hearing what guys want to do, and some of the struggles we're facing right now, and you know the world could change in an instant, but there's there's a reason to come up here and put yourself out there and and just it, it, it humbles you too. Everyone needs to be humbled every now and then and kind of test where you are. And you come up here and that's where you can put it all on the line. And if I could just offer anyone coming through in the process coming up, I would just say that like knowing, really knowing and digging into your strengths and weaknesses and how to mitigate those weaknesses is going to be, is going to be huge. And the only reason I bring that up and wanted to share that is because at our end of course, 360 feedback, I saw a lot of trends where, um, specific to the introverted people 
it's you're not changing who you are, but you just got to know how to how to mitigate that. And you can't wait. You have to be able to be uncomfortable and jump right in because if you wait for when you're comfortable to start showing who you are, it's it's going to be too late. And then for extroverts like myself, is no basically when to shut up because you're rambling. Over to you one two. Yeah, honestly, um, I I talked about this right afterwards after going through this, this experience. I think everyone should come up here. It doesn't matter what your aspirations are. If if it is to work at this organization, I think you uh, you should come up here with a mindset of not worrying about getting selected because you're going to learn some things about yourself. One hundred percent. And I think all of us got the opportunity, whether you were selected or not, to learn learn more about yourself than people will in their entire lifetime. And I think that this selection process is is great for that. You're going to learn how to give and receive feedback and get better as a person and bring that back to your organization. Because in that short amount of time that we're able to work together, I feel like I know some people better than I know. I've known people for years just because we were able to sit down, give each other honest feedback, and then you can see the growth in that person uh, from one day to the next versus what we typically do is we kind of we shun or we uh, we avoid the feedback and we let that person continue their negative behavior and they never get better when we could have just corrected it on the spot and they could they could be a better person and it makes your entire organization better. If you're thinking even a little bit about coming up here, 100 percent, there's nothing to be afraid of. This is a great process. It's very professional. And if you stick to that mindset, you'll get through it and you're going to be better on that on the other end of it. Thanks. One, two, four, four. Echo in one, one and one, two with that, you know. Everyone should come up here and, you know, if you have that slightest inkling that you might want to come see what this is all about, you need to come up here. Um, you know, any reservations that people have, whether, you know, it be family life, you know, I got the wife and kids or, you know, I don't know if this is what I want for my career. You know, I don't know, you know, wh whatever you're thinking, like you need to just kind of put that off to the side and really come up here. You know, they have the support structure up here for your family you know, to keep them, you know, engaged, you know, and active and safe when you are gone. Um, and, you know, the mission set is everything that, you know, pretty much why everybody joined. You know, everybody joined for some reason, and that reason is going to be able to be achieved here. Um, so it's, you just got to put all of those, you know, kind of negative thoughts off to the side about, well, why I shouldn't do it and quit making those excuses and really just come out here and give this a shot. Because I think if you do, you will, your eyes will open up and you'll see kind of a bigger picture and you'll be far more, I guess, appreciative of that effort that you made to step outside of your box and really go for it. Awesome. Four, eight, round us out. Yeah. I just really like to um, kind of just speak to the young guys in the community. Um, whether it be senior airmen or young staff sergeants, um take it from me like i've been in just a little over four years and not even at a unit 10 months and uh i got up here and you know put it on the line but uh i would just say like years ago young guys wouldn't get that experience up or that uh opportunity up here like you had to have certain experience to come up here and and uh, assess and uh, that's just not the case anymore um, if you're waiting on a deployment or you're waiting to gain more experience, like, man, you're not, um, you're probably not going to gain any more than you would when, if you're up here. So kind of put those thoughts in the back of your mind or the back of your head about actually let those thoughts go because you don't need a ton of experience to be the right person, uh, for this organization. So yeah, don't be scared to come up here if you're a young guy and, uh, Show them what you got. So. Appreciate it, guys. That's awesome. Um, safe travels home. Go grab some omelets. These guys are going over to do gear sizing right now at the unit, so they got to get going. But go grab some breakfast. We'll see y'all. Uh, we'll see y'all when y'all get here, man. Congrats. Thanks, sir.